In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, please be seated. There is a great movie that was made several years ago entitled The Contender, and Gail and I had the opportunity to watch it the other night. It was on HBO or Showtime, one of those. And it stars Joan Allen in the title role with a great supporting cast of people, some of my favorites, Jeff Bridges and Sam Elliott, Christian Slater, and Gary Oldman, who is playing the protagonist, which he does so very well. Now, this film centers around the confirmation hearing, a Senate confirmation hearing of Joan Allen as Senator Lane Hansen, who's been nominated to fill the vacancy of a departed vice president in Jeff Bridges' presidential administration. If you have seen it, you can understand what's getting ready to happen. If you haven't, I hope that you'll be able to follow along and might get a chance to see it later. Well, the confirmation hearing that takes place, which is the bulk of the movie, is fraught with contention because of a question that has been raised about how the senator, Lane Hansen, conducted herself in a very private manner while she was in college some 30 years ago. And some accusations were made to, that proved to be completely false and absolutely fabricated. And the character that Joan Allen plays feels that the questions that were asked should not even have been asked in the first place, especially since they would never have been asked of a man. That in answering in some of these questions, that it gives power to individuals and in the confirmation process that should never be discussed in the first place. It's a moral game of chess at the very least, and... What it really is, is a story about people. It's a fascinating film which challenges us to examine our varying morals, our loyalties, and our self-sacrificing commitments to the greater good and how those may change throughout time. It is one of those rare films where, because of the diverse characters, we find ourselves wondering at different times in the film, which character would I be? What is my part in this film? Would I possibly be a different character at different parts in the film? Would I grow? Would I start as one of the characters? But by the time the film finished, would I find myself siding more and trying to identify more with one of the other characters? And then also, can I see and acknowledge someone else's perspective other than my own? In today's Gospel, Luke recounts the parable of the dishonest steward, as we all usually call it. It's really about the dishonest steward, his master, and the master's debtors. The strength of Jesus' parables as a mode of teaching is that they really are people's stories. One author describes parables as grassroots lessons, connecting the ordinariness of life with the extraordinary nature of God. Parables can offer clear insight into God's choice in our own lives as well. In our Gospel reading, we have a manager who is accused of squandering his master's property, not making the best use of what was given him, something that he did not even build in the first place, something that wasn't even his. So the manager, fearing that he is about to lose his job and all that he cares for and his status, being relegated to now depend on the people that he once controlled, decides that he needs to take some action. In this case, he goes to all of the people that owe his master money and instructs them to take their bill and to lower the figure or to refigure their debt in such a way that will make them like him more because he has lopped off a great deal of what they now will owe. In essence, he is rigging the game and shifting responsibility off of himself and on to everyone else. And not to mention the fact that he's just flat out cheating the man to whom everything is ultimately owed. One might look at this story and easily ascertain that this parable is not only about pettiness and greed, it's about control. This shrewd or deceitful manager has a control issue. 
one of the very things that God teaches us again and again and again is to try and give up control. We have even boiled down this teaching into non-scriptural vernacular by saying things such as, let go and let God, or I've turned it all over to Jesus. Jesus is constantly trying to help us realize that the gifts that we have ultimately have in our possession come from God and that they really are not even ours in the first place. We are told in Scripture to give of the first fruits, to leave the edges of our field unharvested so that the poor can share in the bounty which God has made possible. We are taught by Jesus in no uncertain terms that if what we seek is eternal life, we must be willing to give generously of ourselves. It starts with us. If what we expect is a full portion of God's grace, we must be willing to give as much of ourselves. To do otherwise is an attempt to control God. Now here's how it usually works. We get in prayer and we say, we get ourselves in a bind, something happens, we're sick, we find ourselves at a work or we find ourselves in a jam and we say, Dear God, I just need this prayer answered. I just need this favor this one time. And if you can get me out of this, I promise I'll never do that again. And in return, I think that I'll give you this fair portion. I'll promise to pray tomorrow. Or maybe we'll find our saying, Certainly, God, you don't need any more out of me because you're God and you already have everything. Besides the person over there, that person, he has more than I have, he'll take care of it. He'll cover my share. We deal and bargain with God as if God is selling carpets in some sort of Middle Eastern market stall. We bargain. We bargain with God. We leave tips for God. And when prayers are answered, it never even dawns on us to invite someone in to share the good news and to let them know how God has worked in our lives. Just share it with them so that they too may have the possibility of being on the receiving end of God's grace. It's hard, but we need to stop trying to control God's grace with our checkbooks or the amount of pew space that we have and willing to share or our classroom space, or our parking spaces, or the time that we give, or the amount of time that we will share with someone who is desperately, desperately seeking the presence of God in this parish. I know that this congregation has an incredible and almost endless capacity of love and compassion for individuals, individuals and causes which need to be addressed in this community. I've seen it happen over and over again. What we struggle with here at this parish is that we struggle with meeting the day-to-day commitments and the needs of another as we struggle to live our lives in this sometimes very, very unforgiving world. We seem hell-bent on keeping this parish at the threshold of unconditional generosity, right there, just not quite ready to give in completely, standing right there in the doorway, at the threshold of marginal survival. We seem unwilling to venture into the space which allows us to fully welcome and embrace every single stranger that walks through the front door of this church or to fund the very ministries that we as a community have decided are important to us as a community. We've got a control issue. We live our lives in a world in which it is very apparent, very apparent that we have less and less to say about how our lives are lived out. We no longer are secure in our jobs or even certain that we can maintain the homes that we live in today. We live in a world where it seems that we have no control over the price of food, the price of gas, the price of insurance and utilities and taxes, our bank accounts, or even medical care. We have less control. Someone else is making those decisions for us. So perhaps we compensate by deciding, well, deciding that we will control God by controlling the church. Because after all, church is optional. We can do what it is we want to do. God will continue to be God 
God will continue to be present, but we can decide freely not to show up, not to participate, or decide to what degree we're going to participate. And really, it probably won't affect how God treats all of us back. God is still there for us, open arms, welcoming. But we do stand at that threshold where we are trying to decide, can I control this one last thing in my life? But church is not the place to do that. Controlling the church by limiting who or how many we fully welcome into the fold or how willing we are give to the church what it needs to carry out, what the community has decided is essential. Those are the things we need to watch out for. Those can be control issues. They're frivolous. I have seen this parish community time and time again step forward to help not just anyone, but everyone who is truly in need. This parish's generosity a couple of weeks ago with Dr. Park is a perfect and shining example. Dr. Park is here with us today. It brought almost everyone who was gathered here that Sunday morning two weeks ago to tears. We were all here. We heard it. We saw it. We experienced it. It was absolute generosity off the chart. But at the same time, while all this was going on, I heard stories that the church already had all that it needed, and why were we raising more money? Well, I thought that that was a pretty remarkable assertion when the budget is underfunded by $70,000, and guests in this parish who come in on Sunday morning are allowed to depart out those doors without so much as a hello for more than one or two people in this parish. Folks, radical grace deserves radical hospitality. Some members of this congregation wondered how, if there was a budget deficit, which there is, how we could afford to remodel a single room in the back of the church. Well, let me answer that for anyone who has a question one more time, because I have said it before. The room is being remodeled because of the generosity of two people in this parish who donated the funds on top of their already very generous pledges. It's paid for by them. It does not come out of the church's operating account. It is radical hospitality in action. We really do not need to get into such pettiness, refusing to pledge or share our gifts because a room is being remodeled is a perfect example of a control issue. Now, if you really think about it, think about this for a second, not a single block, not a single cinder block or foundation has been poured and added to this property in over 25 years. For all but a very few, everything that we have here on this campus was here when you got here. And it was already paid for. We have absolutely no debt. Someone else took care of that for us. They provided this gift for us. As far as building for the kingdom of God, we seem to have a moratorium on hand. But where we can shine and where we do shine, where we can expound the bounds of our generosity is in the ministry that we provide to people on behalf of Jesus Christ. That is where our strength lies. We've been given a gift of having this campus and having it paid for, and all we have to do is to maintain it, which is not cheap, and to maybe to put a fresh coat of paint on some things every now and then, again, and replace the roof, which won't have to happen again as long as I'm here, because I'm not going to be here for 40 years. I got that guarantee from the roofer in writing. But those are the things that we need to do. Those are the things that are important. We need to be opening our doors of worship not for those who just want to be assured that someone else isn't in our seat, afraid to invite people because it'll put too many people and I won't get to sit where I usually get to sit. And when I show up for church in the morning, uh, there's somebody there in my seat. Or the parking lot is full. Or they're taking up too much space. We need to provide a place of worship for the perfect stranger who has not even figured out that we are even here yet. Or maybe provide a place of worship for the person who doesn't even figure out, hasn't figured out that they know that we are here and that they need God and that God is available for them. 
that we offer the most profound worship experience and unbridled grace in this entire area. I really feel that's the truth. We really can do that. The real presence of Jesus Christ can be found right here at St. Mary Magdalene Episcopal Church. And we celebrate that every single Sunday, every single Saturday, every single Wednesday. Heck, we celebrate that every single day when we just show up at a hospital room, someone's bedside, or feeding someone who is sick, feeding someone who is hungry, caring for someone who is sick, providing funds for someone who doesn't have a home or can't meet the rent. Frankly, I don't think that this neglect is a conscious decision. I really don't. I, I don't think it's our, it, we go out with the intention of doing that. It's not a conscious decision on our part but it is happening. And that is exactly where evil injects itself into the holy. It is where the holy is profaned by evil. We just may be unconsciously trying to control one of those last few places where we can have a choice in order to compensate for our lack of control everywhere But my brothers and sisters, conscious or not, once we recognize the behavior, once we've recognized it, once we've claimed it, once we've named it, it is incumbent upon us to correct it. We've got to change it. We can't just let it go by. God has a mission for this church. God has a mission for this parish. Knowing Christ and to make him known is what we as a community have decided to do long before I ever got here. It is a good and honest expression of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not all that there is, but it's a darn good start. We are going to hear from our junior warden this morning talk about this in our announcement and where we need to go, where we stand, where we stand financially, where we stand as a membership, where we need to head, and what we can do to try to correct it. It's not something that everyone wants to hear, but it's something you need to hear this morning. And for those of you who are new here this morning and think, holy smokes, I walked into this church, and every time I walk into a church and talking about money, I apologize. We are a loving and welcoming community. But like every family, we need to get our house in order every now and then. We've got to take a look at some of the things that we're doing, and we've got to figure out what do we need to do to make this work. So we are going to talk about that. We are here to worship God. We are here to offer our prayers for ourselves and for others and to celebrate the very real presence of Christ among us right here at this altar. But we must do so without bargaining and without trying to be shrewd in our dealings with God. I think if you'll reread this morning's gospel message, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about about how a good dose of honesty coupled with a large heaping dose of generosity every single day can make a change in our lives. Isn't that what we expect of God? And if it is, why are we so quick to shortchange God? Why are we trying to just shortchange God? Why do we ask God in our prayers to be with us, to help us, to change us? That's what Holy Communion is all about. Each and every single one of us should approach this altar every time we come here and celebrate Holy Communion, asking God to change us, to make something new in our lives, to change that which we cannot change ourselves, to create those little miracles in our lives, to leave our junk at the altar rail. Bring it up. Leave it here. Leave it for God. Let God deal with some of that stuff. Allow God to work throughout your life. Bring up your prayers. Bring up your concerns. Celebrate Holy Communion. Say the prayers with us. Participate together. Come, receive the bread and the wine. Everyone, all of you. You don't have to be an Episcopalian. If you are here, we want you to share in this holy meal with us. Share with us. Ask God to change your lives. Don't come up and just do it to be doing it. Don't come up and just figure same old, same old. Expect something new. Ask God to change you. Ask God to make a difference in your life. Now, this morning's gospel parable ends by saying that if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, 
Who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or to be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You cannot serve your own needs at the time, in the very same time you are trying to live out a life that God is asking you to live. God is calling on you to be someone different, to do something different. If this is a people's story, if this film that I spoke about earlier is a people's story, which role were you able to identify with in the film if you saw it? Where do you find yourself in the parable that you heard this morning? Which of those characters, when you hear that parable, do you identify with? And most of all, which role have you assumed at this parish? Which role have you assumed at this point? The opportunities are absolutely endless.